Oklahoma City has dug themselves into the proverbial playoff hole. 111 to 98. Game two loss to the Houston Rockets puts the Thunder down. Zero to two in the series. The good news is, Zach, the series moves to Oklahoma City for the. Oh, wait, no, no, no. That doesn't happen anymore. Welcome to the era of COVID playoff basketball. And, you know, we've talked about that uh, whole home court advantage and not home court advantage and really not being significant in the bubble. But suddenly, when you look at the position where Oklahoma City is in, where they play much better in game two than they did in game one and still have a double digit loss. You could absolutely use uh, some of the Oklahoma City fans cheering and screaming and doing their thing for Game Three, couldn't you? Yeah, and actually, it's interesting you bring that up because I was uh, I was texting Craig about this right at the end of the game. I feel like coming back from two zero is so hard to do because part part of the reason it's so hard is even if you do win two straight at home, you still have to go right. into Game Five and play in a place where you just lost two straight. Say you lose that one, you're going to have to win game seven then on the road. And it's so hard to lose two straight on the road and then turn around and figure it out and, and yada, yada, yada with that. I feel like in the bubble, obviously every game is technically neutral, despite the fact that the records show that the, the home team is still doing a much better job uh, through the seeding games, through the mm -hmm. playoffs so far. So it's weird that that's kind of the case. But I feel like because it is a neutral ground, if the Thunder figures it out, then maybe the comeback won't be quite as challenging as it normally would be. Now, don't don't put me on record as saying Oklahoma City is going to run it back and 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 get the backdoor sweep here or anything like that. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying I feel like this is – you have to look at the context that we're faced with. This series uh, doesn't fit into the context of every other, every other NBA playoff series ever. So maybe there's something there. Maybe I'm just grasping for – for some uh, glimmer of hope, I don't know. That's that's a definite possibility. So we'll just have to see. Well, if you're looking for something, you talk about a glimmer of hope. If you're looking for some good news to out of this game two loss, it, you got to start with SGA, a, a team high 31 points, played 37 minutes, nine to 17 from the floor. Uh, also gave you six rebounds. So you know we we were, he was a big disappointment. Uh, in game one and he was one of the guys that we talked about you, you got to come back and you got to you got to get stronger in the backcourt and it starts with that guy right there now I passed up on I passed him up on on FanDuel today immediate regret now uh, <laughs> but um, but yeah I mean look it, you, you got to find positive because there's at least two more games left in the season so you got to find something good coming out of this uh, game two loss and I think that's exactly where you start when you're looking for the positives yeah, this I, – I hate to sound like this guy because it sounds like I've already given up, but the season was supposed to be a wash. Right. The Thunder right. wasn't supposed to be here. And so I almost came into the series reminding myself of that, like, hey, buddy, you're getting too excited. If this all goes poorly, you got to remind yourself, remember, this wasn't supposed to happen anyway. So this is all icing on the cake. Uh, w with that being said – I look at this, uh, I, I had a, some guy in my mentions on Twitter after game one saying, SGA fooled you, he's nothing but a glorified role player, and I'm sitting here like, wait, I, I've heard some hot takes, but that, that's pretty steamy, mm -hmm. uh, calling SGA a glorified role player. He, he, he has proven himself time and time again, he has the potential to be an outright superstar. And, I, and that's not just coming from Thunder homers. That's coming from anybody and everybody that kn knows anything about basketball. So I was just – I was already irritated with that mindset. He, he bounces back and he puts on this type of performance. He gets back to playing the type of basketball player that he actually is. He looked scared in game one. He looked like a second-year player in game one. He looked like he didn't know what to do in the playoffs in game one. He flipped the switch, and in game two, he comes out and he looks like the killer that he's been so many times during, during the season. He looked like a seasoned player that has seen the playoffs before because he has. He looked like a guy that's not afraid to go up against some of the league's best, like he's done consistently game in and game out. So this is honestly exactly the type of performance I expected out of him. And it all started with he, he quit trying to be so timid. He quit passing up on shots. He started attacking the basket. Mm -hmm. He started off four of 10, not incredibly great percentages, but he was getting to the free throw line. And if there's one thing that we tell our players in high school basketball, it's look, if your shot's not falling, attack, get mm -hmm. to the rim. 
whether that's getting a layup or getting fouled and getting yourself to the free throw line, shooters love to get to the free throw line if they can't knock down a three. They get to a free throw line where they're also good shooters. They see it go through the hoop. It's just a mental switch that helps them figure things out, and then it kind of unlocks the shot. And that, that's I felt like that's what he did today. He, he was able to drive and attack, and even when – uh you know, he, he was getting some contact, not getting every single call. He got to the free throw line 11 times, knocked down 10 of those. That's the kind of performance I want to see out of him. And that's what the Thunder is going to have to see out of him the rest of the series if they want to stay in the chance. Yeah, and some of this interesting, we didn't talk about this after the game one loss where he had the bad performance, but it, it's a new role for SGA. You know, he's, he's got playoff experience. We talked about that. You specifically mentioned him losing, you know, going up, going up against – Golden State in round one last year and the Clippers losing that that series but they were extremely competitive in that series but SGA goes into this series this is his first time being in the playoffs where there's a lot expected out of him there, there's a lot on his shoulders whereas last season as a rookie with the Clippers hey anything you got out of him was just gravy because he was the rookie on the team who had a lot of potential now he's that second year guy who's taking a leadership role and really carries some of the burden a lot of the burden for scoring on his shoulders so in a in a large sense game one was a brand new playoff experience for him now that he's kind of you said kind of hit that next level, click all the right boxes, and has had a great game two experience. I expect him to really be solid, whether it's two more games or whether it goes four more games or however many more games this series goes. I expect SGA to be a solid contributor from this point forward. Now that he's checked the box, now that he's done it, uh, I think he's kind of he's got his feet wet and he's there. Am I expecting too much now, or do you agree with, with that? I agree with your assessment completely. This is one of those things that first game was a feeler game for so many people. It was a, it was a feeler game for Billy Donovan. He had no idea. Here's the thing. The Thunder had not played this version of the Houston Rockets, mm -hmm. and they're still trying to feel it out. Billy Donovan's got to make adjustments. Shea, was, it was a feeler game for him, and he didn't do enough feeling. That, that was my take. He only took, I think it was 10 shots in the first game, which to me is not nearly enough. Didn't get to the free throw line nearly enough. Uh, almost doubles his field goal attempts, gets, doubles his free throw attempts. Uh, he elevated his play. He changed up, went back to, not really changed, went back to his style of play. And obviously it worked because what he does, he, he got in his bag of tricks, if you will. Right. And he pulled out his, his classic style of play. And it's worked all season for a reason. I think that now that he's done it, again, uh, it, some of that, uh, that young man swagger that he has about him that he's going to continue to bring. Now, I'm not saying if he manages to drop 31 a game the rest of the series, I like Oklahoma City's chances. I'll just be honest. I don't know if he's going to put up those kinds of numbers, uh, but I do think he will be a lot more efficient. Uh, the fact that he only had one turnover, I'll take that any day of the week, any game ever from a guy that's, that, that can be a high usage player at sometimes, a guy that uh, really operates best with the ball in his hands, especially from a young guy. He's only in his second year. So uh, I do think, I, I agree with you. I think he's going to have a, a solid rest of the series now that he's settled a little bit and he's kind of trying to figure things out. Uh, he's not one of the guys on my list that I'm concerned about moving forward. Yeah, and just to clarify, I'm not saying that SGA is going to produce the type of, you know, scoring outputs that he did right. today throughout the rest of the series. But what I am saying is I expect what he does throughout the rest of this series, again, be it two games, five games, whatever it is, I expect it to look a lot closer to today's performance than it did on Tuesday's performance. Absolutely. Is, is where I'm going with that. Now, Absolutely. speaking of – Speaking of guys making their playoff debut, Lou Dort, not big on the, on the scoring factor, rough day shooting three of ten from the floor, but what you got from him defensively, it, it, it's, worth having, it's worth having him on the floor and only scoring eight points if you can get that type of defensive effort out of him. Yeah, I'm actually upset that he did not play more, particularly down the stretch, and we can talk about Schroeder struggles uh, after you know, that this, fourth quarter. That fourth quarter was rough. With with it was yeah. Uh, Dort though, uh, up until you, you know he played primarily the first three quarters. It was one of those situations where he starts the game on Harden. Harden comes out. All right, Dort, you get a break. Harden comes in. All right, get back out there. Mm -hmm. And he basically matched Harden minutes for minute until 
they got to the fourth. And through those first three quarters, uh, Dort holds uh, Harden to two for 12 from the field, including one for nine from, from three. And the thing is, he's so solid. He just – he gets in the way. He stays in the way. He makes shots difficult. He, he's not going to go block a bunch of shots, but he's going to – you have to change the way you shoot when he's guarding you. And he did a fantastic job at it. Overall, he finished the game at a plus four. So, ob- obviously, he did something well. I thought he shot the ball maybe too many times. Uh, got into a little bit of foul trouble and got – you know, picked up his fifth foul. So, maybe that might have been – something to do with it but at the same time Billy Donovan didn't put him in at the end and mm-hmm. Harden finally started to score a little bit there was one uh in particular where I could have swore uh Dort took a charge I thought Billy Donovan should have should have challenged it instead Harden gets it gets to shoot free throws um I thought it was a terrible call I thought it, I thought it was definitely an offensive foul uh much of Twitter agreed with me I know it's a lot of thunder thunder people so they're they're gonna say that but I definitely thought it was worth the challenge and he didn't use it. He ends up using it one play later on a questionable sideline out of bounds right. call and didn't win it. So I, I feel like that was a missed opportunity, maybe a little bit of a, a momentum shift there that should have occurred. But uh, I, I coach JV basketball. I'm not, I'm not an NBA coach. I, I don't know all the things. Uh, might, might have been a, a little, little bit of a flub by, uh, by Billy Donovan. But overall, uh, what comes down to it is the Thunder lost. So mm-hmm. it's, it, it's unfortunate because Dort's shining defensive game really is going to get buried because it doesn't matter. And that was kind of the tale of the night was the Thunder did enough defensively. They, they didn't quite meet the challenge offensively. And, well, uh, yeah, they did. And they did, I, I think, the, the fourth quarter. I mean, clearly Houston going on that, that run to start the fourth quarter. Oklahoma City was able to answer runs there at the beginning of the, of the third quarter. They were able to bounce back, but the personnel on the floor to start that fourth quarter, that's going to be the story of this game. And you look at SGA, by the way, in the notes sent by the one and only Zach Lowe, uh, SGA with 31 points becomes the second youngest player in Oklahoma City history to score 30-plus in a playoff game. Um, You look at that, you look at what Lou Dort did through three quarters, you're right, that's going to get lost in the story of this game but if there's hope for Oklahoma City in this series, and let's not act like the, the Rockets don't go through, go through shooting slumps. Let's not act like teams don't come back from 2-0 deficits or 0-2 deficits. So there's still hope. Hope's still alive. We'll, we'll talk about that later in this podcast. But if Oklahoma City is going to come back and make this a series again, those two storylines have to be at the front of the performances for the Thunder. It's got to, We've got to be talking – Every every post game we've got to be talking about Lou Dort. Every post tank game we got to be talking about SGA, and we've got to be talking about him in a positive manner, not talking about a bad performance. Another guy that we've got to talk about though in a positive manner, and we haven't been able to do that yet, is Dennis Schroeder. And you know, I I had a, a, a pregame conversation with Craig. Uh, he's not with this because today's his birthday. Shout out! So I, I will tell you this. Um, we were talking about specifically SGA and Schroeder. And I, I picked Dennis Schroeder to be the guy that kind of has the, the game, the bounce back game today. And I thought he, he would also. And Craig said, nope, it's going to be SGA. And even though he's not with us, we, we got to say, man, we're, we're, you're 100% on point. Uh, and, and Schroeder, man, you, you look at that final, that final game in the bubble against the Clippers where he was almost perfect. 13 points across 32 minutes, 5 of 12 shooting from the floor. Especially, you know, the way he played Harden in that fourth quarter, that, that was the game right there. The, the way he played Harden defensively in that fourth quarter, uh, you just got to have more or you got to do something different. Yeah, so for me, let me, let me check my, uh, my rotations here to see. It, to me, it wasn't even so much how he played Harden in the fourth quarter. It was what happened actually leading up to that. Mm-hmm. So with uh, as soon as the, the, the fourth starts, Chris Paul hits a shot, puts the Thunder up by three. I, I'm feeling settled. I, I think, okay, the Thunder's in a good spot. Over the course of the next four minutes, Schroeder puts up three bad shots in a row. He turns the ball over another time a couple of possessions later. And in that four minutes – the Rockets go from down by three to up by 11, 
Yeah. Schroeder checks out. They scored three more points to complete the 17-0 run. I put the major, major load of that run on Schroeder's shoulders. Now, obviously, he's one of the five guys on the court. You can't blame him completely. Uh, Chris Paul definitely needs to take some of the, some of the burden of uh, the, the, the mishaps of this game as a whole, but particularly those minutes. But to me, that right there is – this isn't his game. Just because you have played him to finish the game so many times this season doesn't mean you have to. That This was not his game. That should have been the signal to Billy Donovan, okay, I'm pulling you out right now, and you're not going back in. That should have been the moment Dort comes in and stays in and, and because he, he comes out, let's see, Schroeder comes out at like the seven, I can't remember where, seven something mark, seven and some change, and – Harden comes in right after that, and then Schroeder comes back after sitting out for all of one minute, it might have been, and then it was just, it was chaos again. Mm-hmm. Offensively, Schroeder did nothing. He scored, let me see, my computer's taking a second to show what I wanted. He scored three points in the last, like, six and a half minutes of the game, and Harden scored 11, and that was all on Schroeder. That the yeah. defense was it was inexcusable, and again, I mean, Dort put him on locks. Dort put hard on locks for for the whole game, and that kind of flips the script there. So it's Schroeder gives up the big run. He's a, he plays a key part in giving up the run, and to me, it started with his poor offense. His decisions were bad. He was turning the ball over. He wasn't hitting shots. He was taking bad shots. So on and so forth. Pull him out. He's a guy that's supposed to be in there for offense. You can live with a little bit of bad defense if you're playing and you're, you're contributing offensively. You can't be bad on both ends. Dort was at least playing solid defense. He should have right. been the guy in. Schroeder has – listen, new baby, concerned about the family. I'll make excuses for him for like hey, – I'm, I'm past it. <laughs> if he does not – listen, I don't know if he's trying to get home to his family sooner than later, but that's what he's working on right now. And – but listen, I'll say it right now. The Thunder will not win another game if Schroeder does not turn it around. The, the series basically hinges on his performance moving forward. He has to fix it. I'm putting – most of tonight's loss falls on his shoulders in my mind. He has to be the one that really flips the switch. I thought – I was with you. I thought tonight was going to be his game. I thought he was going to turn it around and, and he was going to come out and do some, some great things because you don't see a lot of inconsistency from him. You don't see multiple bad games piling up. If he doesn't turn it around on Saturday, uh, I, I don't see the Thunder winning that one, and they're definitely not going to have a chance at winning the series. So it, it's – he's going to have to he, – he needs to come out. He needs to have a 30-point game, really. That would be incredible. Uh, he doesn't have to do that, but he needs to turn around and do something to flip a switch, so to speak. Well, he needs to be able to believe in himself, and and maybe even more importantly, he needs to have his teammates believe in him. Um, and one thing that I wanted to get your opinion on in that fourth quarter, because it, we did talk quite extensively about the Schroeder on Harden matchup, but you know Jeff Green, who was pretty quiet the basically the entire game started getting going there in the fourth as well. Late third into the fourth, Jeff Green, definitely a second-half guy today, and um, it wasn't, wasn't the same performance we saw out of, out of him in game one, but still kind of the, that factor that, that, that makes you go, man, we just can't have this guy beating us as well. Yeah, here's what boggles my mind is he play, Jeff Green plays the final 20 minutes of the game without a substitution. I don't know how he wasn't like dragged off the court because in my mind, he, he's not in shape enough to be able to do that, but he did. And what it comes down to, and th- this was defense got the Thunder in position to win. Mm-hmm. I felt like it was the offense that let them down. And once the offense let them down, the defense then started to falter. They go so hand in hand. It's never really just one sided. Right. It's it's a dual uh, situation, a dual a double edged sword here, if you will. And because the offense could not get it going at all, the defense started to falter. And that's where Jeff Green comes into the situation. They're running just a, you know a, a few actions to get him open, and rotations start falling apart again. And I don't know if you know if you're blaming young guys. Baisley and Nader were in there for a little while. Uh, Schroeder's not the most proficient defender. But uh, when it came down to it, they just the, the rotations were still struggling. And I get it. 
uh, you're playing against a team that, that's much smaller, much quicker than you are, uh, that, than you're typically used to. You got to figure it out. We're two games in. Billy Donovan's got to make the adjustments. It's up mm-hmm. to him to, to fix it. Yeah. Um, and and here's, here's going to the other bench, though. If By the way, this is the Thunder Nation podcast. He's Zach. I'm Matt. Um, let, let's go to the other bench, though. Let, let's stick on the, on the Houston bench. You, you've got a, a 2-0 lead in this series. And both of the leads, are, I'm going to go ahead and say they're, they're convincing wins. They're, they're double-digit wins. Do you worry about Russell Westbrook at this point? Or do you just leave him on the bench and say, get healthy, I'm not even going to bother you on game three, and then we may bring you back for a closeout game if that's, if that's something. But, I mean, I, even, whether Oklahoma City wins game three or whether Oklahoma City loses game three, if I'm Mike D'Antoni, I don't think I worry about Russell Westbrook at this point because I don't think he needs to be a factor. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you there. If he's not 100% to go, why would you? Yeah. Um, and, and that's not a knock on Russ. You, you know, I, I, I love him to death. And here, here's a question I posed to Twitter, and Craig and I were having this conversation. I, I text Craig and I go, man, Dort really is more important to this team than I realized. And that mm-hmm. got me thinking. So I, I threw this out there to Twitter. I said, am I crazy for asking this? I'll ask you this question. Is Lou Gwentz Dort more important to Oklahoma City than Russell Westbrook is to Houston, specifically in this series? And, I mean, what do you think? Yeah, I, well, look, here's how I'm going to answer that question because you know me and anybody who listens to the, this podcast or our Sooner Nation podcast or reads what we write at Heartland Sports, heartland-sports.com, free plug. Um, anybody who knows me knows I love fantasy sports. And so I'm always into fantasy basketball, and we play daily fantasy sports. And one of my strategies is to find who's the point guard opposite of Russell Westbrook. Because it, it's almost a guarantee that they're going to have an above-average game against Russell Westbrook. And when you look at this roster for Oklahoma City, you've got scores. We talked about SGA. We know what Chris Paul can do. There are guys, you know, even Schroeder, who's had two bad games, there are guys on this roster who can go off for 30 points on any given night. And sometimes there's multiple guys who can do that. What you don't have on this roster is a lockdown defender in the mode of what Andre Robertson used to be. And let's not act like Dort's kind of a slouch offensively. He had a, a, a subpar offensive game, but it's his first game back since spraining his knee. But, yeah, I say right now in this moment, when you look at – I mean, the stats don't lie. You, you can say James Harden had an off day. I choose to believe it's not a coincidence that it was Lou Dort guarding him the entire time. Mean, you got to give credit where credit – Lou Dort wasn't there in, in game one, and look what James Harden did. And then Lou Dort is there in game two, and boom. Totally different result for James Harden. So there's just not a defensive presence like what Dort can bring in this situation. Now, th- that could change in, in a second series when you, you look at going up against a team like the Lakers or going up against a team like the Trail Blazers, who one of those two is going to be sitting in the second round for whoever survives this. It's a different monster there. Then suddenly guys like Steven Adams and Jeremy Grant, they become a little bit more valuable to you. But specifically in this moment, yeah, you, you look what Houston's doing without Russell Westbrook. Okay, so he hasn't even contributed, and, and the Rockets are up 2-0. And you look at the, the, the gap that Oklahoma City closed from game one to game two on James Harden, and the, the factor there was Lou Dort. So I got to say, in, in, in this context and in this conversation, yeah, Lou Dort's definitely more valuable of those two guys to their respective franchises. And, and that was kind of the general consensus on Twitter. And again, I don't know if that's Thunder fans being Homer or, or what, but I, and that's that's not it to me. Nobody's going to look at Russell Westbrook and Lou Dort and say Lou Dort is a better basketball player right, right now, right. or probably ever. It, that that that's that's a fact. Okay, that's the gospel truth. That Russell Westbrook is the future Hall of Famer. Lou Gwentz Dort, he might be a future first team All NBA defender. Uh, who knows? We'll see. Mm-hmm. But. As far as what they do for their teams, Dort is an anchor defensively. Mm-hmm. And, and I keep saying this, it wasn't the defense I thought that was the problem tonight. It was the offense. And that's where, uh, kind of transition the topic here a little bit, give Houston credit where credit is due. They're playing the best defense they've ever played in their minds. P.J. Tucker in the post game, he said that he thinks if they continue to put forth this effort, they can be the best defensive team in the NBA. And I was like – well, wait, wait a minute. That that kind of threw me for a loop there. I 
I wouldn't go that far. I can appreciate, you, you know, be, be confident, okay? Right. Uh, stand up for your teammates. Th- think that. Play like that in your mind. Maybe don't say it out loud. I don't know. But play like that. And that's the thing. That's what they're doing. They're committing defensively on, uh, on a high level. And it's not so much that they have the talent to do that. It's just the second effort. The team that has the second effort so often can can get the win. The team that will fight for those 50-50 balls, and they're winning a lot of those right now. They're getting a lot of those extra rebounds on both ends of the floor. Whereas, uh, I, I mean, I'll be honest. For me, what they have done best is they've kind of neutralized what Chris Ball does for a team. And I'm not going to bag on CP3 now. I, I, I've been behind them this, right. this whole – not the whole season, but almost the whole season. I, I flipped the switch pretty quickly on him. And, and if it were not for him, Oklahoma City would not be where they are right now. Mm-hmm. But he's been so neutralized in this series. And I, I don't know if that's, uh, if that's brilliant strategy by, you know, by D'Antoni or if they've just, they've just done a good job at taking him out of the game. But so much of what he is effective at, they've stopped him from being effective at. And, I, I mean, he's, he's kind of – Kind of the other guy that I'm leaning on. I'm looking at, you know, stat line. He had a pretty solid game one. Uh, stat line game two. It's not the worst thing in the world. You know, 14 points, six rebounds, two assists, only two turnovers. He didn't shoot particularly well. But a team worst minus 36. I mean, that's that's wild. Okay. Mm-hmm. So in the, in the 11 and a half minutes that the Thunder played without Chris Paul on the court, they're a – Plus twenty three, like that. That that's it. Now listen, plus minus. So we all know that that's a variable stat. Yeah, you have to apply some context to it, and I do believe that 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 is the case here. But he he has to be the leader. He even said in post game, he said that he has to do better. He said he he essentially he said I have to show up, and that was kind of the thing. He he didn't quite show up. He wasn't the. Uh, the playmaker, the difference maker, the X factor that he's been so many times for this team this season. And fourth quarter crumble, that, that's kind of what happened. Was an area where they've been so clutch throughout mm-hmm. the season, you haven't seen that. And uh, I think if he steps up and rises to that occasion, which I, I have no doubt that he can do that, I'm not really worried about that. If he can do that, if Billy Donovan can make the adjustments, if Dennis Schroeder can get back to doing what he does so well, I think they can make a series out of this. I, I agree. I, I, here's two, two thoughts, though, on Chris Paul. Um, I, number one, I think you look at a guy like Gallinari. He kind of took a step back from game one. He was the mm-hmm. offensive leader for this team in game one. He was below, you know, 5 of 12, below 500 shooting from the floor, only 17 points, one for three from three-point range. So Gallinari wasn't the offensive weapon that he was in game one. And then – that. Oklahoma City's got to figure out what to do with Steven Adams. Here, here's a guy that should be completely dominating in the paint, but he, they're, they're crowding him every time he gets the ball, which is – that's good. That's actually good. You want that to happen because he can kick it back out for someone to make a shot. Well, Chris Paul, 6-15 from the floor. Gallinari, 5-12 from the floor. So Chris Paul in that situation has to become a better scorer than what he was in game. He's got to be a better shooter all around. So if you can get SGA to attack like he did today, you get Steven Adams to bang the boards and to, he had 11 rebounds today, bang the boards and just kind of be your guy that draws all the attention there in the middle. Well, you got to have guys like Gallo and and CP3 that are making their shots, and they didn't today. But, I I mean, Oklahoma City, in my opinion, they're – I, I'm like you. I, I, was, I was the guy who kept the stats for basketball, okay? I never was a basketball coach. But I, I just – I don't understand what they're doing with Steven Adams. I feel like you either got to run a half court with him in there and really take advantage of him or just, you know, let, let somebody else get that run if you're, if you're going to push the pace. Yeah, here's what I see. I see that Steven Adams is four for four in the first half, and he's getting whatever he wants down low early. And then in the second half, they go away from it entirely in the third quarter. And then near, near, I, I think it was in the fourth, they start trying to feed him mm-hmm. over and over and over again. And credit Houston again, they they see it coming. 
because it's so obvious that he's calling for the ball, that he wants it, that they shrink the defense around him. And as soon as the entry pass comes in, he can barely get his giant mitts on it. Mm -hmm. they're, they're swatting at, at him, swatting at, at it. And so it doesn't matter if he gets the ball or it, it doesn't matter if they crowd him, if he can't get the ball, it, like there's not going to be uh, a pass to an open guy around the perimeter if he can't catch the ball to begin right. with. So I, I think part of that – part of the problem was they, they went to him a little bit early and then they went away from that. And then they tried to go back to it when it was too late. There, there's just – that's where I'm talking about Billy Donovan making adjustments. I feel like he's trying too many things in short spurts. Mm -hmm. Bro, we're past that. This is the playoffs. You, you got to have it figured out by now. And I get it. Uh, Mike D'Antoni, I really think he's throwing Billy Donovan for a loop. So uh, I don't think D'Antoni is some sort of like, you know, top-level coach. I really don't. I think he's, he's always been very offensive-minded. Uh, you think of the, the six-second offense with the, with the Suns back in the day. I say back in the day. It was like a little over 10 years ago. Uh, you, you think about Houston shooting. I mean, they had – 56 three-point attempts? Record. That's ridiculous. It's a playoff record, by the way. Again. You didn't know that. Right. Again, okay? It's, it, it's dumb. Listen, that's all they do. They don't shoot mid-range shots. So they're, he's not sort of some complex coach. You know what I mean? But the, the fact that I, I really feel like he's out coaching Billy Donovan right now, and I don't think that's, that's something Donovan can't overcome, but he's going to have to figure that out. If it's me, I'm looking for Steven Adams early and often. That way they have to pack the paint, and that spaces out the rest of the floor, and then you go to work. Whether that means uh, they're looking for him just from the outside, whether it's shade driving and dishing, whatever that means, they have to establish some sort of inside game. Or if they don't, just get him off the court. Right, exactly, and that's what I'm saying. You know, just figure out what you're going to do with him, either use him or or. And I don't, I don't know. This is the first time we're really going to have a disagreement with. Uh, and I don't know if it's that big of a disagreement, but I don't know that you can say that that Mike D'Antoni is not out coaching Billy Donovan because Billy Donovan certainly is searching for something that works. He found something that worked today for three quarters, and for yeah. whatever reason, he moved away. Billy Donovan moved away from it. Mike D'Antoni didn't really do much different outside of running Jeff Green for the majority of the second half. So I, I think, you know, for through two games, Houston has looked the, the part of the better team, and D'Antoni yeah. has looked the part of the better coach. Now, that doesn't mean it's – again, I don't believe that this is over with. I think game three becomes huge. But before we, we approach that subject, one more thing I think we, we need to talk about is, um, is bench play. Five players on the bench. Uh, Billy, Billy Donovan went five deep. Yielded a total of 20 points. Now, keep in mind, I think Nader only played like three minutes. Um, no, it was uh, Dahami only played yeah. three minutes. Nader gave you 10. So, um, you know, for as much as we bagged on Schroeder, Schroeder gave you 32 minutes off the bench, 13 points. The, the, I mean, look, we, we, we can talk about all we want. It doesn't matter, you know, if, if, if Adams is, is scoring double-doubles, if, if Chris Paul's in the 30s or whatever, if your bench isn't producing, you're still going to run into trouble. Yeah, and, and I think part of the, the issue is he's trying to figure out which guys do I play. Mm -hmm. The problem was you had so many of these guys that were effective in so many different ways in different games against different teams at different points in the season. And it's almost like he went too deep, uh, even in the seeding games, which part of that was a result of some of those games were well in hand. And so you just kind of let everybody play. And, and I think that might be kind of, I mean, Terrence Ferguson goes from starting in, in place of Ligwin Stewart to he doesn't see the court. Mm -hmm. uh, Mike Muscala got in the other day. Andre Robertson got in the other day. Not, neither of them plays. Uh, I, I thought Nader, his, it's not so much the 10 minutes that I'm concerned about. It's the rotation. He goes in for uh, at the beginning of the second quarter, and he gets, uh, what was it, four minutes. And then he comes in for like the, the six minutes to start the fourth. It's just a weird timing. Like, listen, a, a young guy, Nader's still a young guy. He's not going to get in any type of flow with that right. type of rotation. Uh, at least his style of game. His style of game is give me the ball, let me try to do something. It's either going to be good or it's going to be awful. There is no in-between with him. And he couldn't do that. Uh, Hami, he was only in for, I mean, three minutes. I feel like that was like a, oh, I'm used to Hamadou Diallo going in, going, oh, wait a minute, you were awful the other day. I just remembered because you're awful now. Get out. And 
again, that like that, I, I get it. Coaches, they try new things, and, and sometimes you put a guy in, and you're like, okay, that's not working, and you figure it out quickly. What I'm really not happy with is I feel like Noel is playing maybe too many minutes, and some people think he should be starting over Steve, Steven Adams because he's quicker. I disagree with that entirely. I think this is – really what, what appears on paper to be a good matchup for him series-wise, I think it's an awful matchup for him because I don't think he's quick enough to guard guys outside the perimeter. He's not big enough to bang around down low and fight over guys for, for rebounds. What I would rather do, may, maybe not from the get-go, may, maybe Billy Donovan needs to pray about this or something, I don't know, <laughs> but I almost want to say give Darius Baisley 20 to 25 minutes. Yeah. See what he can do. Yeah, I can Listen, see that. He's not afraid of the moment. He's not going to hit every – he missed a couple open threes. He, he was one for three. Uh, it, <laughs> that, that's a bummer to miss wide open ones. I get that he's a rookie. I get that, you know, you talk about being afraid of the spotlight and all, all those types of things, playoffs, whatever. You don't have to worry about fans. So, so it takes a little bit of that pressure off. Listen, rookies come in and make impacts, and that's how they get their name made. That's mm -hmm. how stories, legends are made. Let the – I try to write a story here. Let him come in and see what he – listen, if it doesn't work, I'm not, uh, I'm not saying do it from the get-go in game three because maybe it's a terrible decision and, and uh, that would just be the, the, the end all for, for this series. But if you get into another desperate situation early, let the guy have some more run. I really do think he could be a key to this series. I want to see him more at the five. I would love to see a swap, uh, Adams for Baisley, and that's it. Let him run with the other four starters, and I feel like that might be the move. I, again, I don't know, but I, I've been big on Baisley since, since the startup uh, happened. I thought he was solid in the seeding games. I've seen him do the pick-and-pop action with Chris Paul. I've seen him be tough around, around rebounds. Uh, he was a minus 20 today. I don't know if that's just, I mean, he, a victim of, of the circumstances of who he was in with, those types of things. He played with Nader for all of his minutes. So, hello, there, there's some of the problem right there. I just, I think there's more to him than he's getting. And I think the rookie tag, the inexperienced tag, I think that's, that's hanging too heavy over his head. And I don't know how desperate you have to be to give the guy more minutes, but I'm, I'm basically there. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, what what can you lose? You're you're down 0-2. You know what I'm yeah. saying? So what what do you have to lose there? All right, I don't believe this series is over, Zach. I I do believe Game Three is a must win, and not only is it a must win, I believe if they lose Game Three, they're getting swept. Uh, I feel like that's safe. And if they do lose Game Three, I kind of hope they do get swept because I'll be over it by then. <laughs> just to be honest, uh, there there is no there is no glory in a gentleman's sweep. W losing 4-1, there is no – listen, you lose three games and then you win one, and it's almost like all of a sudden, do I have any hope? I might have – that's a terrible idea. You don't want to go down that road. Uh, it's pretty much over. Uh, I, I get – 3-0, has, has any NBA team ever come back from 3-0? That's I know a good we, trivia question. We'll, we'll I don't have to look, yeah, I don't we'll have believe to look that up. So. <laughs> yeah. I, don't, I, I think it's only I happened in all of been, sports a couple times. Well, right, and and we've seen them come back. I'm going to throw this out there. We've seen 3-1, you know, um, but we've not seen yes, 3 <laughs> we have. Uh, I, as far as I know, in all of sports, it's only happened like twice, and I think one of those was the uh, the 2000 – The Red Sox did it against the Was it the, the 2004 ALCS? Was right. it 04? No, nah, I think it was 3. Was it 03? Yeah, somewhere uh, on there. So, so there was the ALCS, Red Sox down 3-0. Uh, they, they come back and, and get the backdoor sweep there. I'm not banking on that happening in this right. series. Uh, yeah, so this I don't even want to go anywhere near that. Being down 2-0 is bad enough. The Thunder has done it before. You go back to the 2012 Western Conference Finals against San Antonio Spurs. Right, exactly. Uh, Oklahoma City goes down 2-0. And I remember Craig left my house, and he texted me, and I could tell he was about as emotional as he could get. He was like, man. I just – I don't know I don't know what to feel right now. He was, I could tell he was in his feelings. I texted him. I said, dude, we got the next four games. Watch. And I, I screenshotted it, and I, I'll have to go look it up and find – I know I've got it saved somewhere. But I totally called that comeback, and it happened. And uh, obviously, yeah, it was just a lucky call, whatever. <laughs> but I, I'm not calling the, the – I'm not calling it this time. I, I can't bring myself to do it because then I'll start getting my hopes up. But th this is familiar territory for Thunder fans where we still hold on to some hope. Some of us, some people are. Uh, I, I don't know if I put this in the notes to talk about. We had. I, I have seen more fire Billy Donovan tweets in the last hour or two than I probably yeah. had all season long, which is just mind blowing. 
absolutely right. mind blowing. Does he deserve some of the blame for for particularly this game? Sure. But fire the guy, get out of here with that garbage. I don't right. want to hear any any Billy Donovan slander like that. Yeah, but uh, you know, those people that are tweeting that are the same people that are talking about what a great coach he is to get him into this position in the playoffs when this was supposed to be, like you said at the top of the podcast, this was supposed to be a rebuilding season. This is supposed to be a scratch season. And here right. you are fighting almost – I mean, basically you got the four seed. You, lo- you, you lose that on a technicality with the tiebreakers, but – yeah, that's that's that same crew that just says was raving about Billy Donovan, you know, four days ago. And now that now they want him fired. So congratulations, coach of the year candidate, uh, you know, top three finalist Billy Donovan, and then here they are, fire the guy. So uh, there's there's not a whole lot of brain power that goes into overreactions like that. That's what I've learned. So I just I try not to engage that too much. All right, so let's uh, before we, we close this out, uh, let, let's look at other game twos around the NBA. Uh, in the Eastern Conference, the Raptors and the Celtics take over 2-0 leads uh, on their respective opponents. I, I think the Nets are done. They, I think they gave a good effort in game two. They only lose by five. Um, did, you, I, did you see the ending to that game? I did, but you're going to have to refresh my memory. What happened? It was, it was brutal. I think it was uh, – Nets ended up winning by what, – what was it? Four points? The, the Raptors, yeah, one by five, 104 to That's 99. That's what I meant, that, yeah. yeah. The, so, so the Raptors are uh, – the, the Nets are down – so the Nets are down by three, and right. they've got the ball with like 10 seconds left, and there's a handoff from uh, – I think it was from Joe Harris. No, no, he got injured, didn't he? So it couldn't have been him. I can't remember who it was. It, it was from somebody to – I think it was Karis LeVert, I'm assuming, because he's their go-to guy right now. And he fumbles the ball. Oh, right, right, right. Yes. And goes diving for it. And then it's just a fast break opportunity for Toronto to seal the game. And it's one of those things where it's like, I, I feel like that's my life sometimes. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? You just feel bad for them because they do everything they can to, to stick it to Toronto, to stay in the game. And they've got a chance to win. You're, you're, they're almost hoping for some sort of Cinderella shot at the buzzer. And you just let it go yes. like that. So it, it was uh, – I felt bad if, for him. But, again, it was it's one of those things. It's, it if, any, if any one play could sum up 2020, it would maybe be that, yes, right? Absolutely. Okay, so I, I think the Nets are done. Um, the 76ers, they're down 0-2 to the Celtics, and the Celtics have looked the part and really had a dominating game two win, 128-101. to do you feel like there's any hope for the 76ers? I no, don't. I, I don't either. I think – I'm trying to remember. I feel like I picked Boston in six. Uh, I'll, I'll have to go back and check. And I, I was really – yeah, I did because didn't you say Boston – or Boston in five? Right. You picked them in five. Yeah. You gave Philly one game. I right. gave them two because I think Joel Embiid, I think he's been solid. But l- listen, his uh, deficiencies – have never been clearer with the absence of Ben Simmons. He is not mm-hmm. a listen. He runs out of gas, and it's obvious. It doesn't. I don't, listen. I, I'm tired of hearing about. Oh, he's in shape. Oh, he 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 can play. Listen. Congratulations on making it through the season because he's not really. And I guess we had the giant gap in the season, so maybe that's why he made it this long. Uh, but but his career has shown time and time again his wear and tear. He's not capable of sticking in for a while. Yeah. He burns out. And, I mean, more power to the guy. I, I don't like him at all. But with that being said, I almost kind of feel bad for him because you see how dejected he is over there. I thought his tears last year were just joyous whenever uh, Kawhi hit that shot uh, because just all the, all the noise he's talked over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm still does. I'm and you. so I'm not a fan of his at all. But I, I can feel for him from, from the perception of he's trying to carry this team. Tobias Harris hasn't really shown up. Al Horford is – He's done. He's, he's, he's that, listen, that contract that he has is so terrible. Uh, it, it's just, there's not a lot of help there. So I think they might, they might get lucky and get a game, but I wouldn't be surprised if Boston gets the sweep here. All right. So let's talk about real fast. Uh, we're, we're running low on time here. Jazz Nuggets, Jazz with a big win on, in game two, but also Dallas with a big win over my Clippers in game two. I, Again, I'm telling everybody, watch out for Luka. Uh, but uh, which one's more impressive, Jazz coming back with a big win or the Mavericks coming back? I think the Jazz win is probably more impressive simply because, it. I, I mean, a 19-point victory, they're up by – doing some quick math here. I think 27 heading into the fourth quarter. It's just outrageous. Uh, Utah is – that. listen, they, they lost by – Bogdanovich, who to me, he was right. so key to putting them into a contender spot. 
uh, that just reminded me that I lost a bet with Craig. So he's going he's gonna to come looking. Uh, I had picked Utah to finish in the top four, and they, they didn't. Record-wise, I could, I could make the argument, uh, but I don't think he's going to give that one to me. But I, I counted them out because Denver was my preseason pick mm-hmm. uh, to win the finals. And I still think they are the maybe the most the deepest team, the most complete team when they're healthy. Right. They're not healthy, but I still feel like uh, Denver's got the best player in the series in Jokic. Uh, I feel like Jamal Murray is a quality point guard. He's he's not uh, the same level guard that Donovan Mitchell is, but he's still really solid. And I thought that was going to kind of be the difference here, but you know Donovan Mitchell and Rudy Gobert they are coexisting well enough to do the things that they need to do super I, I didn't expect this I, if they were going to get a victory I expected to to edge them out barely but mm-hmm. to have it such a dominant one that's super impressive that's not to take away from what Dallas did uh, I think Dallas's win though has more to do with what Los Angeles is not doing well and they they haven't played good basketball give Dallas the credit that they deserve but I'm not chalking this up to Dallas is a better team, or, well, the Clippers are playing good basketball. They're just not getting it. No, I don't think Los Angeles is playing their best basketball. Uh, Clippers fans, you should be encouraged by that, essentially, because I think they can just flip it around real quick. Kawhi is a Stone Cold killer. If Paul George does anything well in game three, it's going to be the opposite end Mm -hmm. where they're going to come out and absolutely dominate Dallas. Uh, I do think it's interesting that, you know, Paul George, he's – how many playoffs in a row is this that he's just he's he's not showing up? Uh, I, I I laughed that he sh- showed up to the post game yesterday with the ice on his shoulder because it's one of those classic like is this real or is he just making excuses at this <laughs> right, point? Right. Uh, I, 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 saw, I thought the same thing when when I saw that you know I was like oh come on Paul you yeah know, you know, he, he to his credit he did bounce back and have a better second half than he did right. first half but. Uh, I think also losing Patrick Beverly for that game too uh, made a big difference there as well. Mm. Um, And and look, I'm not making excuses for my Clippers. I picked them in six, which means I think they'll lose two games in this series. But when you you look at uh, Doc Rivers just now has getting all five of his starters, really his whole team together. Mm -hmm. And then you lose Pat Beverly, Montrezl Harrell, uh, he's only played his second game now since March because he missed all the bubble. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm not worried yet. You know, if they lose game three, I might be become a little bit worried about that. Okay. Real fast. Um, it back to the East, um, Milwaukee trying to even that series with the magic right now, they lead the, uh, they lead Orlando by 12 and then Miami, um, Miami goes up 2 0 on the Pacers. We know about Thunder Rockets. Here's my last question. We got to get out of here. Portland Lakers. Who you got in the night game tonight? I'm taking the Lakers. Okay. LeBron might explode. Listen, I'm with you. I, I, I'm sure you've seen Charles Barkley, and they, they were checking his cup to see what, what beverage he was drinking because I thought he was intoxicated with the way that he was talking about – he said Portland was not only going to win the series. If they win game one, they're going to sweep the sweep. Lakers. Right. Listen, I don't think LeBron listens to any of that, but he sees what happens. He saw what happened in game one despite his incredible game, to me, he's just going to elevate that to, to another level. And I'm, I'm almost concerned because I'm worried somebody might get hurt. He might go off so hard, if that makes any type of sense. Uh, Damian Lillard, give him credit. He, he's been doing some incredible things. I don't know if he can keep it up for a whole series, even if he does. I don't know if Portland can keep it going. Look for uh, LeBron to just go nuclear in game two. And – uh, I, I'm not going to – well, maybe I will here. I, th- I think the Lakers might just go ahead and fin- finish the series out four in a row. Wow. Okay. I'll be, so. I'll, I'll be surprised if that happens, but, but it could. All right, Zach, real fast. You're fun on Twitter during the games. You're fun on Twitter after the games, and you're writing great pregame and postgame content, you and Craig. Where can they find you? Follow us at the Thunder Guys on Twitter. And again, uh, be gentle with the losses. I am a human being. I do have feelings. <laughs> All right, that's going to wrap it up. We'll be back on Saturday to talk about game three. Until then, you can find us heartland sports.com on the internet, also on Twitter at Sports Heartland. Zach, thanks a lot, man. Enjoy, uh, enjoy the rest of your week, and we'll see you on Saturday. Sounds good. See you, buddy.